Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, State Library of Queensland. If this is your um, first session at the Ideas Festival, welcome. Um, it's a very, very um, full program, very exciting and great topics. If this is not your first, welcome back again. Um, my name is Rory McLeod. I'll be facilitating this session for you. I'm the director here at State Library of Queensland. So this is my day-to-day -day terrain. Amongst other things, I have staff meetings in here, so it's wonderful to see a different audience here today. Um, Paul Fritas is our um, presenter today. Um, he, current 2009, Young Economist of the Year. He's younger than me, so I'm allowed to say that. Um, I was looking at Paul's CV last night, and uh, he's worked on a diverse range of things, projects called God's Phone Number, projects on death, expectations, satisfaction, and more specifically, relational capital, creative dis destruction, economic development transition, which rethinks the link between social networks, technological growth, political interference, and economic development. So pretty heady, cerebral stuff from, from our guest today. Um, but today, Paul is going to talk to us about happiness. Does life give second chances? And predictably, we're thrilled to have him here uh, to tell us whether it does. So could you join me in welcoming Paul to the stage? Thank you very much, Rory, for that very kind introduction. And I, I think these idea festivals are absolutely great, so uh, long may they continue. Um, yes, I think the people who are coming in new are, are forced to sit in the front <laughs> row. Uh, nothing to be done about that. Um, so today we're going to talk about happiness, and as I understand the format from uh, Rory and others, um, I'm going to give you a sort of a stand-up lecture for about 35, 40 minutes, and then we're going to have a chat and, and invite the audience to... Uh, to, to speak up and uh, give us their questions and their opinions. Now, I want to start out by, uh, by giving you a sense of where Australian life satisfaction is at. So when we think of life satisfaction, we think of answers to the question, how happy are you on a scale of zero to 10 normally? It could be how satisfied you are. It could be that you are asked to tick a smiley face rather than a sad face. The long and the short of it is that we take these answers and we give a number to it and we aggregate them up. So this graph tells you what life satisfaction does in Australia. And if you start on the left-hand side of this graph, you start at age nine. And if you go right the way to the right-hand side of the graph, you end up at age 90. The scale, as you see, is the lowest is six and the highest is 10. It's not because you can only answer a six, you can answer a zero, but the average never drops, as you can see below. 7.6. Um, where does this data come from? Well, the thick purple line comes from the Hilda, which is starting to be the major microeconomic data set that is used in Australia, and it follows roughly 20,000 Australians over time. It started in 2001, and we're now all the way up to 2011. It's an ongoing project of various ministries and many researchers. And the little dotted line is something that a PhD student of mine has added. So that is, as it were, brand new. You are the first audience to see this graph, that little dotted bit. The little dotted bit comes from Queensland Smart Train. So this is a, a leftover from research done two years ago of a little train that went via all the little towns in north and central Queensland. So half of those dots are actually from Brisbane Central Station because these kids came through the train and we sort of forced them to answer how happy they were. <laughs> and so there's a bit of coercion in that graph, at least from their teachers. Um, but I think that the main story should be clear of this. When are we the most happy in life? We're the most happy in life when we're very young, right? Uh, no one beats a nine-year-old for sheer happiness. Um, and surprisingly enough, in Australia, you can see that we're very happy at the end, near age 90, but from the whole range of about 75 to 90, the average Australian is quite happy at a level of eight and a half. Now, to give you a bit of context, an eight and a half is higher than any average country in the world. So if you just take those group of people and forget about the middle bit, which will be all of us, um, if you forget about the middle bit, you are basically looking at the happiest country in the world. Um, but what happens in the middle is life stresses and all that kind of jazz, and that is when we're at the low tide. But the low tide is still a 7.6, a 7.7, which is well above, for instance, the French, um, is closer to the Scandinavian countries. So on the whole, we're not doing bad as Australians, 
um, the first picture to uh, in your mind to take of this is that life does offer a second chance, which is the first chance you are at happiness is when young, and if you wait around long enough, you get to be old, and there's another chance at happiness. And then there's the middle bit, which is not so bad. <laughs> but it's decidedly lower. So that's the content of today. Um, I think the main thing I want to talk to you about is, is research we've done just the last year, so this is, as it were, fresh of the press, which is the relationship between what we know about you as a kid and what we know about you as an adult. So that is, do you get a second chance after childhood? And in particular, we're interested in the question, well, suppose I know that you are from the skids. You are down and out as a kid. Your teachers hate you. Your parents say this person will be a failure. You know, the divorced kids. You're a boy. It's also bad for happiness. Uh, and everything that's wrong with you in childhood is wrong with you. Can I then say that you're going to be a miserable adult? Or can you have a second chance in life and that many of those who fit that description would nevertheless be happy? Now, that's the first one, right? And I'm going to ask you for your opinion pretty soon on that one. The second one is, well, that is childhood from adulthood. You can also think about second chances as a country as a whole after a recession. We've just been through a recession. Does that somehow permanently make us less happy, or do we bounce back again? And the third one is, again, at the individual level. Right? If you've had a bad break, if your partner has left you, your boss has told you you're no good and has fired you, or if someone close to you has died or you've been very ill, do you bounce back from that? Um, and the fourth, which is the most micro one, which is probably important for a weekend day, is do you get a good chance after a bad week? Okay, um, I think I'll skip some of this. This is, as it were, the nerdy bit, and I was told on a big post that this is not for nerds. So uh, th the main thing I want you to know is the top line, which is, well, what, what, what do people use in this literature? Wha what is all this happiness stuff based on? It is based on asking by now millions of people across the world of very different ages and of very different cultures a question like the top one, which is how satisfied are you at present with your life, all things considered. Now that kind of question correlates with the things you think it should correlate with, which is that people who give a high answer smile more. They're healthier, they're the ones who've, who've got you know, steady relationships, their kids are doing well. Effectively, in all ways measurable, both inside their brain on their face and in their surroundings, they look like people you would think of as happy. Right? Um, and hence, we think that, that, that the answers to those questions do roughly correspond to how happy you really are. How happy you really are is a very difficult notion for economists, for psychologists, and even for neuroscientists, because happiness, by its very nature, is in your own mind. It is how happy you think you are. And to a certain extent, there is no such thing as an objective, oh, that's really how happy you are. We can measure how much electricity goes through this part of the brain or how often you smile, but it's nevertheless something that you evaluate yourself. You can nevertheless feel unhappy. You can also feel that your life has not been worthwhile and that you are dissatisfied with that. So inherently, it's something that only really exists in your brain, which makes it a, a, a supreme subjective thing, and hence we are a little bit relying on the logic of language to say now, we all talk about w that we want to be happy. Let's trust people to the degree uh, that we want to when they say they're happy. So that's that one, and we can skip all that, um, and go immediately to the, to the first topic of the day. So can we already tell from childhood if someone is going to be happy or not as an adult? Now, when we start to look at this question about two years ago, I thought, and I've been in this literature for about 16 years, I, I sort of thought the answer to that is probably yes. I expected to find that if you were born down and out, you were born in a bad neighborhood, and your parents were no good, they were either not around, or or had everything going against them, if your teacher said, well, you're, you're not going to end up well, that that would be a good indication that you were going to be miserable as an adult. That's, that's what I thought, right? that there was going to be a very high degree of predictability. Now, how do you look at a question like that? Um, the people who've got the data to answer it, this, I'm afraid, are the British. So we're going to answer this for the British. Uh, for the Australians, you cannot answer this question yet. Because what you need to answer this question is follow people from early childhood to late adulthood. And you need to keep hold of them, and you need to keep hold of more than just 10 of them. You need to grab, let's say, 20,000 kids and pester them over and over again in their lives with questionnaires, and you send nurses to them, and you ask your teachers. Now, that is one hell of an exercise, right? And so the Brits have done that. So what I'm going to show you is data on a cohort of people born in a particular week in 1958 in Britain. 
So everybody who was born in that week, and they got out all the hospital rolls, everybody was contacted. So they sent all the researchers out, and they, they sort of measured, well, how, um, how much did this little uh, born kid weigh? What about the parents? And they, they sort of asked the nurses, and they all did all kinds of tests on this sort of screaming little kid. Um, and that was their first observation. And then seven years later, 11 years later, 14 years later, four years later as well, 24 years later, they go back to the exactly the same people born in exactly the same week. So if you happen to have been born in that week, you're a bit unlucky in that they keep on pestering you. Um, but these kids, well, they were born in 1958, so they are 53 today, right? Because um, I think we've, we've passed the week cutoff point. Um, and so we now know about everything that you can sort of possibly measure at childhood, because they really went all out. They spoke to the teachers. They put cognitive tests on these people. They, they talked to the remand services, the prison. They, they, they pulled out all the stuff. This was a huge ex uh, exercise, an enormous enterprise. You can just imagine, 20,000 people. You've got to keep track of them, measure them on all sides. Um, but we now know uh, how happy they were in adulthood, because we asked them how happy they were when they were 24, when they were 33, when they were 40 when they were 47. Um, so we've got a knowledge as to how happy they were in adulthood, and we also know what happened to them in childhood. So we're now in a position, at least for that group, to say, if you were down and out at the end of the 50s, at the beginning of the 60s, um, are you happy now? And you can test your own intuition by saying, well, what do I think? I mean, what do you as an audience think? Do you, do you think that you can tell a happy adult already as a kid? Do you, think, do you think that's, as it were, in the cards that you as a teacher or as a parent can tell? Well, I'll tell you what the answer is relevant for. Why, why does an economist want to know this sort of thing? Well, economists are creepy people to some degree, <laughs> right? Which is that you, you give us something to maximize, and we will tell you bluntly what you have to do to maximize. So, for instance, if you're interested in the happiest possible society, well, if I, if I can tell which kid is going to be a, a happy adult and which not, that partially gives me an incentive for selective birth control. Right? If you know which of your which of the babies are going to be the happy ones and the unhappy ones, you can try and manipulate the ultimate uh, outcome of adult happiness by picking the ones who are going to be happier. Um, there's also the whole uh, purpose of early life intervention in school. If we think that we know what makes you happy as an adult, we can try and go towards that. We can try and have our education structures oriented towards making happier adults by putting in the things we believe that help as a kid. And of course, it can even help in migration policy, right? Again, this is the creepy economist type mindset, which is you, you tell me you want to live in a happy country, well, then I tell you who you should let in at the borders, right? It's the logical consequence. So it's for that sort of thing that, that we want to know these. So this is, as it were, the big outcome. Um, what you have here is a distribution bar. And on the vertical axis is the proportion of the subsample. So this is the subsample of individuals whom we know both when they're very young, uh, i.e. at birth, and who we know as adults. So it's sort of an average of their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And the subsample, hence of the original 20,000 for whom we have all that, is about 10,000. And the bars shows you just how, what the proportion is of those samples in different happiness states. So you can see that the majority of people are in the eight, uh, nine, and seven categories. That's where most people are in. But this graph also breaks it down into two different groups. One is the group who came from high socioeconomic status at birth, and the other is the group who came at low socioeconomic status at birth. And I personally expected the high socioeconomic status at birth to, as it were, have more mass points. That means there's your higher bars at the higher happiness levels. And for the low socioeconomic status ones to have more mass point, i.e. higher bars, at the lower happiness levels. But instead, you see something interesting. You see a bit what you expect, i.e. there are more people of high socioeconomic status who give you a 9, and there are more people of low economic status who give you a 5 and a 6. So for a 5 and a 6 and a 9, what you'd expect goes through a little bit, which is that if you were born rich, if your parents were rich, high socioeconomic status, you're more likely to be a nine and less likely to be a five and a six. But one of the interesting elements is that you're actually more likely to be a 10 if you are from low socioeconomic status. So as it were, the highest level of happiness seems to be more attainable if the childhood was bad. 
more generally. And I suppose that is the, the, the biggest point to take from these graphs. These bars are not that far off each other. There is actually exceptionally little explanatory power of social economic status, because you see that some social economic status kids are happier, even on average, right? Uh, and some are less happy. You can just see it from the nine and the tens. So if we think in terms of variance explained, or as it were, the number of kids who are able to predict, then as a rule of thumb, if I just know your social economic status at birth, I can only correctly predict about one out of 100, maybe two out of 100. But one out of 100 is probably about right. And I hence can't predict the 99 out of 100. So what does this tell you? Low socioeconomic status does not predict later life adult happiness. It basically predicts almost zilch. A tiny bit, but almost nothing. What about test scores? What if I put you through a school test score? And I group all those who do badly at these tests, and this could be math or English, basically the same kind of thing. Um, and this is hence at age 10. And I compare these graphs again. Well, again, the same picture emerges, which is that if I look at the people who do bad, they're more likely to have a 5, they're more likely to have a 6, but they're also more likely to have a 10. And the people who do well are sort of the people more bunched in the middle. So I get a similar kind of picture, which is that if you're down and out as a kid, on average, you'll do a little bit less well in terms of adult life satisfaction, but some of you will actually do even better than the people who had the good breaks as a child did. And once again, the correspondence between these two bars is actually pretty close. And so the predictability of these tests is very, very low for adult life satisfaction. Um, then you can ask the question, well, okay, is it all about genetics? Uh, and I'm just showing you here the kind of table which, uh, which nerds often look at, which would has been me. Um, and you know, you, you get these kind of numbers and they basically tell you the correspondence between life satisfaction at age 50 with life satisfaction at age 46, 42, and 33. Now you don't have to read the numbers because I'll tell you the bottom line. And the bottom line is that no more than 30% of life satisfaction, so 30 out of 100, no more than 30% can possibly be explained by genes. Right? We didn't actually measure genes, but we do measure people over time. So if it's in the genes, then it should be the case that you basically give us the same life satisfaction number every time we look at you, because it would all be genetic. If it's not in the genes, then you can have a different life satisfaction number every time we ask you. And hence the bottom line is that no, it's not genetic. Right? Genetics explains, even at best, very, very little of life satisfaction. So it's not your genes which predispose you to be a happy person or an unhappy person. Maybe a bit, but not actually much. Um, and so it's neither childhood nor genes. So in that sense, the news is immediately good. You do get a second chance in life. You may have bad genes. You may be born on the wrong side of the tracks. You may have done crap at school at all the tests. But life offers second chances. You have about as good a chance as someone who had all the advantages with the better genes and the better life, uh, childhood circumstances as uh, of achieving a reasonable happiness level later in life. So. You know, we, we were quite excited by that result because it tells us that our societies, as we don't penalize you forever, at least not in terms of life satisfaction. They do penalize you more when it comes to income or when it comes to a, a better paying job. Right? Then I can tell a lot more from childhood. I can tell at childhood who's likely to have a good job when they're age 30 or 40. That is much more predictable. But life satisfaction, which if you like is the, the ultimate outcome, more important than the income of the job, uh, is still up for grabs. Right? It's not in the genes, and so you can still attain it. Life does offer second chances. So the policy implication, good news one, right? So good news one is that you're not going to get a happier population by shooting the unhappy at birth, <laughs> right? Now, that is actually good news, right? Because if we found the opposite, then we'd sort of have to pussyfoot around that conclusion and sort of have to pretend it's not there. So now that we don't find it, we, we find the one which is, as it were, more politically and socially desirable, we can put it out there, right? No, that is not going to help. Um, good news, too, is that it's not all lost in childhood, right? There, there, there's actually no real happiness down and out. It's not fixed by genes. It's not fixed by your childhood circumstances. 
And this includes everything we know about you. And we know an awful lot about these kids. We know whether they were emotionally unbalanced. We know whether they got in contact with the law. We know what their cognitive scores were. We know whether their teachers told them that you're, you're, you're going to end up on the wrong side of, uh, uh, of life. And hence, even the emotionally unbalanced and the troublesome kids often turn out to be quite happy adults. So that's great news, right? Now, there is a bad news, which I already flagged a little bit, which is that what goes for life satisfaction does not go for everything in life. So income and good jobs are much more predetermined by, by childhood, which is about up to 30% variation, which in, a, in its simplest form says, we can explain, as it were, the outcome of 30 out of 100 in terms of income and their jobs, was that we can explain maybe at best four out of 100 in terms of their adult life satisfaction. So there's a lot more to which you know, the, the good jobs and the, the, the good socioeconomic outcomes are predetermined. But there's got to be a, a but in this kind of preliminary research. This is in its infancy, right? You are basically talking about a literature that's only just starting to emerge. There have been no big publications on it yet. yet. We're all talking working papers at the moment. Now, that is hence life as a second chance for you as a kid and you as an adult, which is, in a sense, a good news story. Then we'll go on to the second topic, which is, well, are there second chances as a country? Right. Um, and let me here give you the outcome of the World Value Survey founding, uh, findings, which give you some background as to how happy whole countries are. What you've got on the horizontal axis is GDP per capita, and this is some 2,000 data. Australia is by now twice as rich as it was then, mainly because our currency has gone through the roof with the mining boom. Um, but you still get a very similar picture. You see a bunch of poor countries. So the index is, again, average happiness. As you go from left to right, you go from poor to rich. And you can see that actually money buys quite a bit of happiness. Right? There is quite a steep gradient from poor to rich in terms of how happy you are as a country which is good news for economists because it means that at least there's some value in chasing money. Um, well, it's, you know, that's our, that's, that's our main job, is to tell governments how to get rich. I mean, it's, it's, the, old, it's the economy stupid idea. Um, you even get this for growing countries. So if you look at a growing country, particularly if they were down and out, like a country of Russia, which is the bottom left bracket, you find a strong correspondence between average life satisfaction, which is the bleak back, uh, big black curve, and the incomes, which is the dotted blue curve. And that actually also goes for Eastern Germany. So income and aggregate happiness, particularly at the lower ends, actually do move together. And so the point of that is that there is a happiness country, happiness cost to a country for being poor. But it's only undone if the country becomes rich again. So this is, as it were, uh, I wanted to briefly expose you to what has been the main point of the economics of happiness literature, which has been to look at happiness and income and happiness and economic growth. And the long and the short of that is that once you're at the top, it doesn't matter how much richer you get, but as a country as a whole, there is a real benefit for moving, as it were, from the low-income uh, countries to the high-income countries. There's a real increase in national pride and how well people feel in the country. But what about in a country over time? Right? So what about second chances of a country of a time. What you're now looking at is data for America. This is Gallup poll data. Gallup poll data uh, is, is essentially based on asking a 1,000 people, and these are a different 1,000 people all the time. Every week of the year, a 1,000 people are called by the Gallup poll in the US, and they're asked how happy they are. So a whole year is 52,000 individuals, and here you're looking at two years and a half, so you're effectively looking at a graph that summarizes something like 130,000 individuals. Um, and this is, of course, also the time of the major recession. Right? There's been a major recession in America, which bottomed out roughly at the start of 2009, and then went up again. And what you see is a very strong correspondence between the business cycle and aggregate happiness in a country. We've got less good data for any other country, though we know this now better for the US than we know it for anyone else. But as far as we can tell, the picture is actually very similar for Australia, is very similar for Europe, which hence tells you that that green line is almost exactly the same as if I would run a line on GDP growth. And hence, for a country as a whole, there is also a second chance. There is a second chance in the sense that you see where 
the happiness level is before the start of the recession in January 08. And you see where it ends up after the recession in January 10. Aggregate production is a little lower. They actually lost money. There are more people unemployed at the end than at the start. There's more problems at the end than the start. More debts, right? More people who still lost their homes. But nevertheless, aggregate happiness has bounced back. Right? In January 10, it was actually slightly higher than it was in January 08 at the start of the recession. And hence, at an aggregate level, there is again a second chance. Right? A country goes through a major recession. That e does create a lot of unhappiness. It's a bad thing in terms of happiness. But a country as a whole bounces back again, even though America is, is really still sort of in recession. Now that we've looked at the aggregate and we've looked at childhood, let's now look a little bit over the life cycle again. Right? It's the graph I started out with. We're happy as kids. We're happy when we're very old. What about the middle bit? Right? Chances on average and individually. Why do we want to know about happiness over the life cycle? This is average. Well, economists don't really have got a good reason to be in this literature. We're, we're essentially just out there out of curiosity. Um, we make up economic reasons to be interested in this. And one of the economic reasons you can make up is to say, well, if you know what age you're happy you're at, then we're willing to pay more for you to be alive at that age than the age at which you're unhappy. So it goes a bit towards the notion of trade-offs as to whose happiness at what age we should care more about. But no one really takes that seriously. So it's just us making up reasons. Right. Um, and there are two pictures I want you to see in terms of life satisfaction. That one on the left is life satisfaction again. But I've now focused on the changes over life. And hence, you see that the scale has been changed. Right? This is what statisticians are good at. We can lie with numbers. And so the bottom is now 7.6, and the top is 8.4. When I showed you the same graph earlier on graph number 1, the bottom was 6, and the top was roughly 10. And so it seemed as if the change in life satisfaction was much less. Now I'm making it seem much bigger by effectively taking out the bits which the graph never went to. Um, and it hence becomes more stark. Right? So the drop in life satisfaction becomes more stark visually. It really seems like there's a big depression in the middle. And one of the questions is, well, now what can, what can predict that big depression in the middle which goes away at old age? And what is the prime candidate for the big depression in the middle? That is this one at the bottom right. The bottom right is a measure of aggregate stress that we experience at each age. How is that made up? It effectively makes up by adding up all the life events which happen to you. And the life events include good things like a promotion. They include things like getting married, getting kids. But they also include life events like being fired, having a health problem, having someone die in your vicinity, um, and negative financial shocks. And effectively, what the bottom right-hand graph says is that our aggregate stress goes up an awful lot in mid-age just because there's much more happening to us. We are active and all kinds of things change around us both for ourselves and for others who are of the same age. Um, and those two graphs match up surprisingly well. So aggregate happiness and aggregate stress seem to be the opposite. What kind of stress? Right, I've already said. OK, no, 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 that's fine. Um, so aggregate stress here means, um, and uh, I was going to explain in the slide I was just at as to where, uh, how we exactly measure it, but we basically mean the average of a particular age. So aggregate stress is effectively a weighted average of how many life events happen to you if you're age 19, if you're age 20, if you're age 21, 22. And the top left is the aggregate of the happiness of people who are 19, 20, 22. All that. Um, no, no, that's good. good. Um, and hence, this slide also explains a little bit is how did the aggregate stress got made up? Well, the stress was hence the weighted sum of 21 life changes. And they included some positive ones, which are income improvements, marriage, having a new baby, promotion, etc. So we just count the number of people for whom this happens at every age. And that was what it was. And there's also negative individual changes, which is things that are negative at the individual level. Income reductions, divorce, death of a spouse, death of a friend, injuries, victim of crime, being ill, etc. Now, I just showed you the aggregate. 
of all these life events. However, I measure both positive and negative things, so I could look at individually, I can aggregate the positive things and I can aggregate the negative things. Um, and the positive life events are here, the red bar, which is this one. Eh. <laughs> You're busy. Um, and there's the negative life events, which is hence the dotted blue line. And you can sort of test your intuition by asking yourself which one of these actually fits life satisfaction better. And what you would think intuitively is that surely it's got to be the case that the negative life events explain the inverse of happiness, which hence you'd think this thing is going to be sort of the opposite of the happiness index, right? The negative life events. And the positive life events should sort of not be related once I allow for the negative life events. Well, it turns out, and we don't really have a great explanation for it, but this is exploratory science, right? It turns out if we run a regression, and I only want to show you this um, because I want you to see the numbers, is that negative stress is bad for life events. That's why it has a negative sign. But positive stress is also negative for life events because it's also got a negative sign. And the things in the brackets, you want them to be as high as possible because they, they give, as it were, a sense of significance. Um, and what does that hence mean? Well, it's the opposite of what you'd intuitively expect. So you'd intuitively expect the negative life events to explain happiness and be bad for happiness, but it turns out that at the aggregate level, certainly not at the individual level, at the aggregate level is the positive life events that are bad for life satisfaction. Now, you know, as researchers, when you come up against a finding like that, you scratch your head and you think, well, maybe we shouldn't send this to a journal, nobody's going to believe us. Um, or you come up with a story as to why this may be true, and you go and further examine that, right? Because to a certain extent, science is most interesting when you come across something you didn't expect. If you just get what you expected, it's dull. So the positive life events. Now, what could possibly explain that? Well, one of the stories we've got in the back of our mind, and this is very much research in progress, is that this is jealousy effect. This is peers effect. Because this is an aggregate, right? So what does that mean? Well, it would mean that at the individual level, it may be great for you to get married, but all your friends are pissed off. <laughs> right? And that is the effect which causes aggregate life satisfaction to go up. You may or may not believe it, but it's the only logical explanation we have on offer so far, but to be revisited. Okay. Now, that is all at the aggregate, right? That is hence at the aggregate level of childhood, later life, um, at a country. But what about us individually, right? Do we get second chances if something nasty happens to us? This is the best data I can give you on that, and that is actually Australian data. Australian data is, is very good when it comes to life satisfaction. We're very interested in this as a country, so we spend a lot of money in this Hilda data set. These 20,000 Australians followed over time. And this is about as, as good a type of picture you get in terms of what happens to you individually. So these two lines, they're just two different methodologies. So what you really care about is just the curvature of the lines. They tell you what happens before and after something happens to you. So time zero in these four, gra four graphs is also always when something happens to you. And the top left is when you get a major improvement in finances. The top right is a major worsening in finances. The bottom left is a death of a spouse child. At the bottom right is a serious personal injury or illness. And the way to read these graphs is hence to see the change from minus 8, which is two years before something happens, to plus 8, which is two years after something happens. So the 8 stands for quarters. And what you hence see is that a major improvement in finances does lead to an improvement in life satisfaction. It m makes it increase by about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Not so bad. Um, but you can also see those lines, and they're just two different methodologies, they're returning back roughly to the level they were before. This is even clearer with a major worsening in finances. A major worsening in finances is one of the worst things that can happen to you as your li in your life, so people really do stress about money. You lose about 0.5 in terms of your life satisfaction when it happens, so this is sort of a couple of months out of the, uh, of the major worsening in finances, but you see all the upturn at the end, you bounce back. And so roughly two years after a major worsening in finances, you're almost at the same happiness level as you were before it happened. This even goes for a death of a spouse or a child. You see there again that it leads to great unhappiness. It's the worst thing that can happen to you in our data set. There's nothing as bad as losing your, uh, losing your spouse or your child. It's the most traumatic event we've got in the data set. It's happened to several hundred people in the data set, so that's what it's based on. 
But again, you see a bounce back. You see a, a major worsening in life satisfaction, but you see that about half that effect has gone after two years. Um, and you also see that a serious personal injury actually does you much less happiness damage than the death of a spouse or a child. But there again, you see a major bounce back. Okay. And these are just, as it were, other life events. So getting married leads to a buzz, but it wears off. <laughs> Interestingly enough, it's a bigger buzz for women, <laughs> but it wears off just the same. <laughs> And the separation from a spouse, we bounce back of that pretty quickly, uh, right? And why do we bounce back? We find someone else. That's basically the reason we bounce back. Okay. So individuals, we do bounce back. And we usually bounce back within two years of almost any event, a bad event or a good event. So life, again, offers second chances. Things may look very bleak if you have a very bad event happening to you now. You may have lost your job, your wife has left you, or your husband has left you. Your kid may even have died. Nevertheless, life does go on, and several years later, you're almost back to where you were. Now then finally, before we get to the question and answer session, we can ask the same question about, what about during a week? Well, again, we've got to turn to the Americans. So for childhood, we've got to turn to the Brits. For the week, we've got to turn to the Americans, because the data just doesn't exist for anybody else. That blue line is that Gallup poll I told you about. Remember I told you about the thousand people that the Americans phoned every week, asked them how happy they were? They actually phoned these people on different days of the week. So they spread it out over the whole week. So the Americans can know what day of the week you're more happy and what day of the week you are less happy. And the blue line and the red line basically stand for, you know, wha what percentage have happy, there's hence a lot of happiness without stress, and the red line is the percentage with a lot of stress, so with a lot without a lot of happiness. Uh, and the essential story of that is that there's an awful lot of movement within the week. And guess when people are happier? During the week or in the weekend? It'll be easy, right? In the weekend, they're much better off. So the song, I don't like Mondays, definitely holds, right? Um, but we bounce back, right? Again, so you, got you, you have a bad week, you bounce back during the weekend, and then it's back to the dredge after the weekend. Um, hence again. We bounce back. So the conclusion, we don't just bounce back once in life, right? We bounce back all the time. We bounce back from the stress of the week. We bounce back from the disadvantages we may have as a youth. We overcome them in terms of life satisfaction on average. We bounce back as a country from a recession. And we bounce back as adults from severe shocks to our lives. We eventually adjust. So life doesn't just offer a second chance, but a third, a fourth. In fact, every week it offers a second chance, every day almost. But of course, I have to say something negative, because I'm an economist. So the same is true on the upside. You may bounce back from every bad shock, but every good shock wears off too. Any great outcome you have, you'll get used to it, and you'll start wanting more. All right? So life is a relentless rat race on the upside. Anything good you achieve, you get used to, you want more. And anything bad, you tell yourself after a while, it's not so bad. Life goes on. You adjust. And that's it, I think. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody. Um, Paul, if you could grab a seat there. We're going to make our way to the comfy chairs. And um, if we've got some burning questions, we'll go straight to the audience. Otherwise, I can. We do. If, if you've got questions, and we have got a couple, just wait till a microphone person makes their way to you, um, so that it can be recorded. Thank you. Hello. First of all, um, thanks a lot for um, the talk. It was really interesting. Um, the question I have is in regard to the graph of like um, different events happening. And I realized that there was happiness level of adoption. And one thing I was really curious about was like um, the happiness level in relation to being fired or made redundant. Mm -hmm. It seemed like that the line didn't differ that much. Do you think that not that many people get affected by being fired or being made redundant? Um, one of the things you uh, hello yeah I'm still on yeah. Um, one of the things which is true about those graphs is that you got to read each of these shocks in isolation, and hence. What those graphs told you is that a negative financial event, which is usually accompanied by being fired, um, is thought of as very, very bad. But just getting fired in itself is not so bad. And so if you like, the, 
what, what is usual for someone, which is a whole process of being fired, includes not just the process of losing the job, but also means that you've got less money and that you've got to get by. Those two things are separated in those graphs. So it basically, you have to think of in those graphs, b that being fired, it's being fired without really going backwards financially. So it's like being fired in a job which pays almost the same as the welfare roll. Right? That is effectively how you have to read a graph like that, which is, well, nothing else changes of those life shocks. So they're all conditional on each other, if you like. So if it's the case that you lose a good job and hence have to go back an awful lot in terms of your income, then it's not just the job you lose, but you also lose your steady finances. And then it becomes a very bad event. Nope, nope. It takes those as, as it were, a, a different shock altogether. And so, because that way it allows you to unpack complicated shocks into sub-shocks, and so if you want to uh, if you want to think of well what is the effect of a whole bundle of shocks you can just add them up. Right, so you can work it out as it were. Uh, there was another question over. Oh there's a few. I'm just <laughs> You're not going to get a word good. in mate. I'm not going <laughs> to get you to ask my question. Uh, just wait for the mic to get to you. Keep your hands up for a sec. Thank you very much. I'm wondering whether economists were tempted to call that bounce back um, anything else. Hope <laughs> yes, triumph of hope over experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, Dying. Um, I suppose my question is with regard to um, the idea of uh, someone being poor and how relative that is to um, a country. For instance, uh, when you think about Australia, how aware we are um, and the comparisons we make with the people around us. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we saw a documentary um, leading up to this event called The Economics of Happiness, and it compared... Uh, people in Ladakh and their um, their lifestyles, and um, the lady visited them and asked them to show them the poorest house in the country. And they said, "No one here is poor. We're living in you know paradise." She went back 15 years later, and she noticed that the same person was telling a tourist, "I wish you could help us. We're all living in poverty," and their living circumstances had actually increased. So, I mean, the idea of of being happy and the idea of comparing ourselves with others seems to be very prevalent. And I was just wondering your observations. Um, well, y this is, as it were, the, the mainstream territory of economists, right? So this, this if, if economists are interested in one thing with happiness, it is how does income affect it? And as a rough rule of thumb, I would say that about two-thirds of the strong effect that income has on happiness is pure status. So about one-third of the effect is that if you have more money, you can buy more clothes, you can buy more food, and you can get out of abject poverty, which is also important to us because... We, we, we don't want to be sick, we don't want to be hungry, but about two-thirds of the effect uh, of income on happiness is because we can have a bigger car than the neighbor. <laughs> right? um, but that is a real effect for people, right? And they are willing to work very hard for that. So uh, as economists, we're also not judgmental about that. It's just that's, that's the nature of us as a being. We, we are very much predisposed to want to win the rat race. And those who, who do not, well, evolutionarily, they've been sort of shot, <laughs> right? So... That's that's who we are. Hi, Paul. Thank you for coming. My question is, um, with the stages of development, you have Piaget, Freud and Jung that would talk about all the different life stages of happiness. And the satisfaction part often comes after, you know, 60 to 80. And then with your graphs, it actually increased. I was interested to see on whether you thought about comparing that with the stages of development as in... Um, economists, by and large, don't know anything about psychology, um, <laughs> but there are always exceptions. Um, but um, I think one of the interesting things to say to, to psychologists who've got theories of life stages is that these graphs don't look the same for different countries. Right? I've, I've basically only shown you the graph of the age happiness profile within Australia, but if I show you the age happiness profile for the French or for the Germans, it looks quite different. In particular, it looks different for the older people. So there's almost no one as miserable as an old German. <laughs> and you'd have thought Jung would have known that, right? <laughs> well, that may be true as well. That may be true as well. That's right. I mean, the the happiness of older Australians is a real anomaly in happiness research, right? The, the old Dutch, old old English are not this happy. So 
it's almost a question, well, what's wrong with these old Australians, right? Why, <laughs> why, why, why are they so happy? I think we've got a question at the back. Yep. In your, your graph of countries, poverty of the countries and, and happiness, what was noticeable was that countries like Mexico and other South American countries that were quite poor were just as happy as the developed world. Um, I think on, on average, uh, it's not true that if I lump all the South American countries together that they're just as happy as the Western ones, but there are clear outliers. Um, and the biggest outlier is probably Colombia. Right? Colombia is a country which is full of violence, which is has many poor circuits. Um, but on this world value scale, they're just as happy as the Australians are. Um, and we often think, well, this has got to be an anomaly, right? So I actually asked uh, a Colombian PhD student of mine, well, is this true, right? I mean, what's, what's happening in these South American countries? And his first answer was, well, it's because the women are beautiful. Uh, <laughs> that was his first answer, as you'd expect. Uh, <laughs> but as far as I can tell, that was a properly done survey. So it, it seems that there is something about some of those Latin American countries which makes them happy, uh, regardless of the fact that they're not so very rich as a country. And the, the two explanations from wi within the usual way we think about this is that A, they don't compare themselves so much to outsiders, so they're more internally oriented than externally oriented. And the second is that we think of quite a few of these Latin American countries as having a quite warm family and um, community relations, right? They sort of uh, are, are able to visit each other easily and that they seem to get on well within the family. Um, but really, we don't know. So the stories I'm telling you now are the made-up stories, which is we think that may be it. But we don't really know. Sure, sure. But we don't really know uh, whether they're actually much higher in Colombia and Mexico than elsewhere, because it's very hard to compare measures for those things over country. So that it's part of the storytelling we do that we think that's what it is, but we don't really know. Sorry, I was just trying to work out where you um, were you able to establish with all your graphs and everything um, how to raise the baseline where you had a baseline for prior two years prior to an event and then an event and then returning to sort of a similar level was there was there any evidence to show a way of permanently raising those baselines um, that is a, a very active area of research both both in psychology and economics to figure out well how can we uh, how can we raise the, uh, the the minimum to which you return, and also how do we make it easier for you to bounce back with the negative effects? Um, the front runner, I in terms of the list of things that we may be able to affect to some degree, is the degree of extroversion. Right. So if I if I'd have to put some if I'd have to say well now that is where the literature is looked at most, it would be on extroversion because extroverts are not just happier, which they are on happy on average but they much quicker bounce back of negative shocks. So the negative shocks, all these bad things that happen to you in life, um, have a much lower duration if you're extroverted. Now, extroversion is something in principle that you can slightly try and teach kids during childhood, right? Um, but we don't really know yet how to do the, the population level. So this, this is an active area of research. So we're, we're into it, but I can't give you a definitive answer. But the front runner is extroversion. So I guess perhaps following on from that a little bit, if s say the federal government appointed you as the, 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 the treasurer of our happiness economy here, what would you do to improve the overall happiness of Australia? Are there things that we can know yet, policy changes or in general that we could do? God, if I had that kind of power. <laughs> exactly, 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 I'd be very happy. Um, yeah, there, there, there are some things that, uh, that, that we think have some effect, right? Um, one of the things we think we know is that in a country which is very unequal, then there are more problems with keeping up happiness levels. So um, to, to keep a lid on the amount of inequality is something important. Uh, we know health is very important for happiness, so a reasonable degree of health care, so as it were, the, the basic goods type stories. Um, the third thing which an economist should tell you if, if they give you that kind of question is that we know that status seeking is a zero-sum game. And so if I have a bigger car than my neighbor, my neighbor has a smaller car than me. And so any investment I make into getting a bigger car in terms of that game is just completely lost effort, right? It's effort I do not spend with my kids. It's effort I do not spend 
or on my wife, my partners, my social relationships. Why? Well, because it doesn't give me the bigger car than my neighbor. So I'm, as it were, locked in a race with my neighbor in which we both lose out because neither of us spends enough time with our kids. Right? And what does an economist say that you should do in that case? You should tax the investments into those status groups. So one of the first things, and this, this has been the, the main advice of the last 25 years by economists in this, is that you should tax heavier all the investments into status groups. All luxury goods should be taxed more. Uh, which is, of course, a politically laden uh, observation. So when I gave a similar talk to the Treasury at the start of this year, I could see the eyes of the top civil servants going, yes, we know this, but they don't want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to the question of uh, cultural differences in happiness. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering whether how actually culturally appropriate were the measurement tools mm -hmm. that checked happiness. Because, for example, I was born in Russia. And in Russia, it's culturally appropriate to say you're not very happy. <laughs> <laughs> not if you're Jewish. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm Jewish as well. Yeah. So, I just wonder what can you say about this? Um, uh, culture and happiness has, uh, has been one of the banes of the existence of, of the happiness literature. Um, the problem has been, A, to sort of figure out some way to measure the culturally specific aspects as of happiness, and B, to find something else which you think should measure happiness, right? And then to see whether the two match up. So uh, economists basically play no role in that literature. All I can tell you is what I think that the psychologists and the sociologists who are very interested in this have found. And one is that they, they, they now think that cultural aspects are not that important. So what they mean by that is if they go to Russia, the Russians don't smile, <laughs> right? And so uh, they, 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 they are a lot unhealthier, right? So after the, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the uh, Gorbachev era, there was a huge increase in suicides, a huge increase in alcohol abuse, and it is still much, much higher than Western countries. So the low levels of happiness, which I, I just showed you for Russia, they tally with the behavior of individuals and with the self-destructive psychological health behavior of a lot of Russians even now. So they don't just say they're unhappy, they behave as if they are very unhappy, right? So um, the psychologists say, well, the, the difference hence can't be all that much. They, they just truly are less, uh, less happy. Um, that is one of them. There is a second thing, which is that they, they do feel that cultures probably have some notion of extremism in, in them. And so, for instance, um, if you go to Brazil, you will find that there are lots of people either at the top happiness level or at the bottom happiness level, but less in the middle. If you go to a country like Australia, we're nearly all in the middle, right? <laughs> and so the tendency to give extreme answers is probably cultural, right? Which is, you tend to exaggerate, but you tend to exaggerate both to the top and to the bottom without all that much aggregate exaggeration. Next question here, and then, um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and, and my question sort of um, understandably there's about six dozens of them <laughs> and I'll try not <laughs> to get them muddled up. Um, Quick piece of paper. Earlier, <laughs> earlier when, you, when you talked about um, uh, we're all very competitive, we want to have a bigger car than the neighbor mm -hmm. and so forth, you really got, the, uh, got my heckles up um, <laughs> because I'm not, I'm not entirely sure whether the data really warrants that and whether I'm willing to believe that, that we are inherently competitive and I think some of the other statements you've made since mm -hmm sort of um, water that down a little, which I'm quite pleased with. Um, I'll build them up again, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, now, having that pointed out, I think I forgot my question. <laughs> um, let's see whether I can find it back. No, I can't. I give up. You'll, you'll get it back to you if you, get, if you, if you remember. Get the mic over here. But I'm, I'm willing to talk about, I mean, this, uh, this is a, a huge research area, right? I, I can talk about a long time for why we think this. <laughs> well, but uh, I can talk about wha why we think this is true, right? Um, sure, sure. I mean, people are quite susceptible to group stories, and if they feel their group as a whole is doing badly, which they do in a recession, that's partly media-led, they will as a whole start to feel badly and they can bounce up again. Um, but it doesn't mean they're not 
you know, innately interested in relative stories. After all, a recession doesn't really mean you're very much poorer because you just go back to the level that the country was at two or three years ago, right? So it's not really about money. It's about a feeling that our country is going down relative to other countries. So a recession almost, if you, if you just look at the amount of money that's changed, it's almost nothing. Right? A recession almost by design is going back relative to other countries. So it's more, uh, 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 as it were, relative speaking at the aggregate level rather than it goes against that story. Um, but uh, economists have masses of evidence to say that, that people are status seeking, right? Apart from the old joke, well, that's what e elections are about, right? It's, is the economy stupid? Um, we run all kinds of experiments on students and on other people where we ask them questions of, well, would you choose for this or would you choose for that? So, for instance, if I give college students the, uh, the option, well, do you want to work in a job which pays you $50,000 but everybody else makes 20000 or do you want to work in a job where you make 100000 but the rest earns 200000 i.e., I'm either top or bottom, but I earn a lot more, they're going to go for the 50000 and the rest choose the 20000 right? So we, we even see that in observed behavior. People will go to, to those areas where they are relatively better, right? Um, there's, there's stacks of stuff on this, right? Uh, it... it we don't yet know whether this is true in every society because, of course, we haven't yet invaded every country with our uh, uh, survey design. But it seems to hold pretty well, uh, particularly in China, for instance, where we're now doing this a lot. It seems to tally almost exactly with what we find in Western countries, which is a, a huge effect of status seeking. Question over here, Paul. Okay, I had a uh, two-part question. <coughs> First was, did you, in any of your research, have you looked at national relig uh, religiosity? religiosity versus happiness. And the second thing was just pretty much at the last point you mentioned, made me think about insatiability. So mm -hmm. it's almost like when you measure people's level of happiness, do you also say to them, how happy do you think you should be? So is there this anything in there that's saying no matter how happy you get, you still think you should be happier? It's almost mm -hmm. like a constant grassy agreement. Um, religiosity, yes. The religious are happier. So that's, that's an, easy, an, an easy answer on that. Yes, religiosity helps. And, and this, is, this is true in, in all the countries we've, we've looked at. It doesn't help all that much, but it helps a bit. The religious are happier. Um, to, to have a, an unseen helper who loves you no matter what you do, it's good, good, <laughs> good. I'm not even saying he or she doesn't exist, but it's very, very good. Um, <laughs> now, in terms of, you know, the I is, it, is it because you're insatiable? Um, Happiness question has been asked in many, many different formats. So the format I showed you, which is, well, how happy you are with life as a whole, is the dominant format. But one of the variations is to ask people uh, as, uh, on a scale where the, this is the highest satisfaction level imaginable, or this is the highest satisfaction level you've ever had. Right? So those come to the notion of a personal scale. Um, you get very, very similar outcomes on all these kind of measures. And so if you like people don't extend their happiest ever had and keep on going with that. They sort of seem to know what their highest happiness level is. They've experienced it, you know, whenever they were five or something like that. Uh, and they now and then bounce again at that level. But they seem to veer within those extremes. They, they don't go beyond that so much. Well, we, uh, we, we, we once wrote an article where we had a, a quote exactly on that. I think it's, it's Thomas Carlyle. He was a bit of a, an eccentric and, and a bit of an elitist. And he, he said that we've all got our heads. Uh, he was talking about pitiful whipsters, and he meant all of us, basically, because we're not nobility. Um, and he talked about all of us as pitiful whipsters who've had our head filled with the idea that we should be happy. <laughs> well, we've got one last Will question here. Yes. Uh, can you hear? Yes. Um, is it, is it a case of ignorance is bliss? And in the case of third world people, uh, where their possessions are not everything, uh, and I'll just use the example of a Buddhist and so forth, mm -hmm. um, these people may not have longevity, they may not have possessions as we know them, but in fact, if you just take one of your measurements, the, the, the facial one, a smile, Mm -hmm. These people, by their very actions in every way, the way they use their hands and everything else, seems to indicate great happiness. What do you say about that? Um, <laughs> um, I've, I've been to Thailand. I, I actually had a, a student from Bhutan, which is where they do the, uh, the national 
happiness level. And um, one of the things I noticed as a hard-nosed economist in Thailand was that the room was full of Buddhist monks and Buddhist politicians. But you know what? The ones in the rooms were the ones who had frequent fly miles and they had big fancy cars outside. And their story was always, ah, oh, yes, we're happy in this country, by which they meant poor people in the villages. Uh, and we like to stay that way, by which they meant don't take my car away, don't take my frequent air miles away. And so I'm always a little bit skeptical when someone tells me I have found a culture in which they are poor, but they're so happy. Right? Um, I just don't believe it. Uh, because when I go to those countries and I, and I see how the system works, I see the same status seeking, and I see that uh, the, the as it were, there's, there's just a different story told upon why it's okay for the rest not to have what they have. But it's the same old greed which works there. Well, but they measure themselves by the developed world standards. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, yet, uh, I mean, I've also traveled to quite a, a, a few third world countries, and what strikes me always is, you know, that they want to be rich too. Uh, it's just not true that they're sort of, oh, I'm poor and that's the way I want to be. That's the way I want to stay because poverty has real effects, right? It, it means their kids cannot go to education. It means that if they're unhealthy, that they're more likely to, to suffer from that long term. They are anxious about, uh, you know, not having a bigger house and they're very busy with wanting to have status goods over others. And so I just don't believe the stories. Well, we're, we're poor, but we know we're poor and we want to stay poor. It's just not true. It's just not how humans are. Thank you very much. We are out of time, everybody. Thank you very much for your contribution and help me thank Paul. <laughs>